My cats is what's keeping me alive right now today. You know, these are my, these are my my. my these, this is my medicine. My cats. You know, without them, I, I really wouldn't know what where I would be right now on the real. I really wouldn't. But with these guys, they give me a lot. You know, to to um, expect and you know, and they're just my they're my soulmates. Cats are. You know, so and there's nothing I would do to give them up. <laughs> okay, so we're off to the start here. Cool, off we go. So Veterinary Street Outreach Services, or Vet SOS, uh, began as an idea of um, a former client of mine named Paley Boucher. She's out trying to help people with their pets on the street, and she'd gone out on the van, uh, the Street Outreach Services outreach van, to do a photo shoot of homeless pet owners. And while she was on the van, she was talking with the outreach workers who had mentioned to her, by the way, a lot of people on the street are asking for medicines for their pets when we come out with the regular physicians or nurses. And I knew that I needed help, so I, I garnered the support of our five community partners, San Francisco SPCA, Animal Care and Control, Pets Are Wonderful Support, and um, the San Francisco Veterinary Medical Association. And with the help of all these other organizations and the support of the San Francisco Community Clinics Consortium, we decided to start this program. Sometimes I can hardly breathe. If anything happens to me, who will take care of my dogs? I thought that was so I was doing a documentary, a photography documentary called Angels, Outlaws, and Outcasts about the homeless camps. Um, I used to live in the camps when I was young. I, um, I grew up on the street with my mother, homeless, and um, basically spent all my life out in the Hunter's Point, down in the junkyards and stuff, and living in the camps. And um, when I was able to get off the street, I wanted to um, do a document, like show these people's faces in a way that nobody else has ever seen them. So I was out there um, taking photographs and every time I would go out they would they would try and get me to help them with an animal that was sick. And there but was immediately one. I was like, you know, this we need to be able to have a veterinarian go out and, and see these people out where they are. The the people who aren't able to bring the animals in to, to free veterinary care at SPCA or any of the other places need to be seen as well. I immediately met with Ilana, um, the veterinarian that ended up like doing most of the work, getting the vets together, and um, the the street outreach program that had gone out before in a van with um, doctors to see um, clients, to see the human clients, and I and I wanted to know how hard would it be to set up to have a veterinarian also on board. It's amazing. People will call if they have cell phones. A lot of the homeless people are very interconnected with each other. A lot of them have been on the streets for a while, so they know each other. They'll call each other on the cell phone and say, hey, the pet van's here, you know, bring so-and-so and tell whoever's camped next to you. And so they all kind of know where we're at and they'll just show up. I think that animals on the, on the street, they basically have the same ailments as animals in a, in a house, really. I mean, there's not a whole lot more that could go wrong except for possibly the exposure to being hit by a car could be higher but um, basically it's the same thing they need their ears cleaned they need some a lump looked at they need um, you know an x-ray of a hip it's basic you know glucosamine for old dogs we've been able to give them you know glucosamine for their old guys and you know just a collar and a, and a leash and a tag you know helps <laughs> But I think the flea treatment is actually a pretty amazing gift <laughs> when you're homeless and sleeping with your dog and you all have fleas. It's pretty miserable. When you're homeless on the street, um, you're so removed from society, like you have your own society out there. It's like you're involved with your own world and your own society, but walking into a supermarket is difficult, you know, it's like not, it doesn't feel comfortable, you know. Um, so walking into a veterinary office when you have no money and trying to convince them to treat your animal is, it just is a very uncomfortable 
um, feeling. And then if you've gone before and not paid off your bill or lapsed in bill payment, you know, it could be really tough to convince them to treat your animal. And if they go to the shelter, um, animal care and control, or some of the bad hospitals, there's a huge fear their animal will be taken from them. In fact, um, it's pretty well believed across the board that if your animal is taken into animal care and control and you're homeless, you will not get your animal back. It will be killed. Other times I find that there's no merit to the complaint. Homeless people are sometimes better pet owners than people who have a house with an address on it. Mm -hmm. So in my experiences, when I do take away animals from the homeless person, I leave it up to the, um, my supervisor to determine do I have enough to keep the animal from them or is it just an education that we have to provide. Mm -hmm. I'm in return returning mm -hmm. um, the pets that the animal control officers take from you know from the public and, and then return it back to the, the homeless person in this case. And it's great working with Vet SOS because what we don't want to do is over vaccinate and it shows responsibility that they are, you know, um, wanting to be part of the vet SOS program so that they can get their pets help and good free help. We decided once we got the project up and running that we needed to model our policies and procedures after another organization that already existed. And one of their clear policies that I really think is important is that they really will only see a pet one time um, without the owner's uh, consent for spaying and neutering. But if the pet's not spayed and neutered, then they wouldn't allow future visits. Trying to promote responsible pet ownership and really help with the health benefit for the animal, but also to reduce the overpopulation problem. So our, our policies, and we make it pretty clear to our clients that we'll vaccinate puppies against parvo once or maybe twice because I really don't want them to get parvo, but they see that we're offering this free care and they trust us and they're more willing the next time to consider spaying or neutering their animal. That is a requirement for us to continue to provide care. Well, I mean, we, we really work hard out there to, to spay neuter every animal we come in contact with. and. Um, We've, it's been pretty well received. Obviously, we can't see clients that won't allow us to spay and neuter, neuter the animals. So it's been pretty well received all the way across the board. We've been able to spay animals at a young age, and it's just been great because the behavior of the animals are, are a lot more um, stable. You know, their behavior is more stable. The people are able to handle them on a, a more consistent basis because they're not, you know, because they're neutered at a young age. And it's a, it's a really good... Um, it's worked really well. I think it's um, stopped a lot of animals from ending up in the shelter. And it stopped a lot of breeding, um, accidental breeding, um, from going on. Um, and the SPCA will keep them over the weekend. Um, they'll spay them tomorrow, spay and neuter tomorrow, and they'll keep them through till Monday, and they'll pick them up on Monday. We have the owner's signed consent forms, which we have in the records, which we take to the SPCA for consent for surgery the owners sign and then we transport them if they're responsible to pick up their pets on Monday and we've never had an animal abandoned in fact we've had a few people come early to claim their pets um, I don't I don't know of a whole lot of homeless people that breed their animal by choice it just happens accidentally which is you know at least they're aware enough to realize they can't handle the, the litters of puppies and stuff so they do they do accept the spay neuter pretty well um, the resistance at first was that we were going to take their animals uh, to be neutered and not give them back or make it hard for them to get them back and that was really, um, it took a couple of months of going out before people realized, you know, we aren't, that's not where we're coming from, we're just trying to help. So a lot of people ask me if homeless people should own pets at all and I think that not everybody's cut out for pet ownership but I has, that has no correlation with how much money you make or if you make money at all. If you're dedicated and willing to have a pet there's no reason you shouldn't have the companionship of an animal. And um, I mean as there's always going to be homeless people, there's always going to be homeless animals and I think it's great if they can pair up and provide each other support and um, that has the potential to help them get off the streets. I think it's wonderful. It's been, quite, it's been very difficult being homeless, learning how to be homeless. So education within itself it, I hope nobody else has to learn, but uh, losing your animals will be the most devastating thing anybody can ever lose, because they're, you know, they're part of your heart. Uh, the other belongings, those are things, but your animals aren't things. You know, they're part of your heart.
once you fall through the grid of society, you don't see much compassion. You see judgment, and you see censure, and fear. And uh, that's not a place to live. If it weren't for the animals, that's about all we'd have out here. When you come homeless, you're disenfranchised from most of the support that you've had. And it's uh, just to hold, hold on to that one lifeline of you know, the pets. That really makes a lot of difference in being able to bootstrap yourself back up into, into the tax-paying public again. And that's where I want to be. But it's, it's, and I think part of the fear that people have about the homeless is hardly anyone in this country is more than two or three paychecks away from being right out on the street. And that's something that you want to keep at arm's length. You don't want to have to think about it. You don't want to have to focus on it. And it's, some, it's something that there is no safety net for. None whatsoever. Once you fall through, you're through. And people like Paley and, and Lana give you enough hope that you can actually make a life again. A life that's worth living.